All right, so this is a shorter passage tonight, only nine verses, Joshua chapter 20, and it all deals with one main subject. And I'm going to go into this subject of the cities of refuge for the, the manslayer to go into and to, to receive uh, some type of a sanctuary from those that would go out and try to kill him. And we're going to dive into this subject. And what I want you to do is keep a place here. There's three chapters we're going to be cross-referencing because this very um, subject is brought up in three different books of the Bible in three different chapters. So I want you to keep your place here in Joshua chapter 20, of course, is our main passage. Keep a bookmark in Deuteronomy chapter 19 and also in Numbers 35. So if you want to find those places real quick right now, put your bullets in there, put something in there, kind of hold your place between all those passages. I'm going to be moving back and forth. Those are going to be the main passages that we're, we're cross-referencing and looking at because we're going to get just the, the big picture. This is only nine verses. And at the end, it just basically the last couple verses, two or three verses, it's just covering which cities are going to be these cities of refuge. So there are six cities that were appointed in all of Israel for people to go to if they accidentally kill somebody and they're looking to not be killed themselves. And we'll get into all the details of that uh, in just a minute here. Now, there's three main points we're going to be covering. One, I'm going to be just going into City of Refuge and what that provides. I'm going to be going into the difference between someone who's known as a slayer or manslayer versus a murderer, because they're two different things. And I'm also going to be covering the avenger of blood and punishment that's going to go along with either murder or manslaughter. So let's dive into this right here. We're starting in Joshua chapter 20. Verse number two, the Bible says, speak to the children of Israel, saying, appoint out for, your, for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses. Now, we're also going to be jumping around more tonight because there are specific verses that are dealing with this. You know, I'm, I'm trying to keep subject matter together, right? So we're not going to go through Joshua chapter 20 verse by verse in sequence, but we are going to go through, you know, pretty much most of the verses of Joshua chapter 20 anyway. So he says here to point out of yourself cities of refuge. A refuge is a, is a safe place, right? We have safe spaces. That's what we have today, right? Safe spaces. Except that these safe spaces weren't for the liberals to not get offended. Okay, the, 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 safe, the safe space, the city of refuge in the Bible was literally for someone to go to to avoid being killed themselves. They're, they're looking for asylum, they're looking for a place to be. And, you know, it's also, and you need to watch out for this. I don't know. Um, I mean, this could be very easily called sanctuary cities. Cities for people to turn to, to, to be protected and look for protection from evil, from harm, from, from some harm coming upon them, from them losing their lives. Now, I, I haven't seen this personally, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit. In fact, I'd be willing to say that I'm 99.9% positive that it's out there, even without seeing it, because I know how people mishandle the Bible anyways, right? So what we have these days is people, you know, these sanctuary cities, you probably hear that in the news where these cities, they're saying, well, we're not going to enforce the laws that are on the books right now against immigration and things like that. And we're just going to allow all these people to come in and we don't care if they've broken law or whatever, you know, whatever their, their whole spiel is on these cities of refuge and I bet they would um, I guarantee you there's people out there who are using scripture like Joshua chapter 20 to support their view now I'm not telling you one way or the other on the whole immigration that we dealt with immigration last week I'm not going to get into that topic tonight that's not the point but the reason why I'm even bringing this up is that you need to be careful when people use scripture and just misapply it to something that it's not teaching what we see here with a city of refuge is very specific to this type of a crime. This isn't, these aren't even cities of refuge for just all crimes. Under all of God's law, anyone who commits a crime, they don't have to run into a city of refuge. That's not why they were created. It wasn't just for all criminals to run into one of these cities. It's specifically spelled out for someone who accidentally kills somebody. That's what it's for. Because you're, you're, you're justly seeking to not lose your life over something that was an accident. And that's what the city of refuge is. Let's look at some of these verses, though, that just kind of deal with 
this, uh, with how it works with the city of refuge. So look at verse number four in Joshua 20. The Bible says, And when he that doth flee unto one of, these, one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city, and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them and give him a place that he may dwell among them. So what happens is, is that someone shows up and he goes and finds the elders of the city. Now, in biblical times, what you'll find, typically the elders of the city are going to be the wise men of the city. They're called elders. Typically, they'll be older. They're experienced. They're knowledgeable. There's someone that you could turn to for knowledge and wisdom. You read in um, Proverbs chapter 30 about the virtuous woman. It says, you know, her husband is known in the gates. You know, they sit at the gates of the city. They, they kind of pronounce judgment, and they have a lot of wisdom to determining right from wrong. That's who it's referring to when it's saying, hey, you're going to these elders of the city to look to them and, and to kind of plead your case to them and be like, hey, look, this is what happened. I came out of, you know, this city over here. Here's what happened. We were working. You know, I accidentally, you know, this, this happened. I dropped something on. This guy died, right? And now his family's really upset. So, I, you know, I, I came here so that they don't, no one comes after me and gets me before, um, before I get a fair hearing, because that, that's also part of what happens with these cities of refuge. It's, only a, it's, it's a temporary place. It's a temporary holding place for people to go to the, to get safety from harm. And one, until two things. One is, first of all, just to get a fair trial, just for people to be able to um, hear all the facts, present the evidence, and say, okay, this is, uh, you know, this guy's either guilty or not guilty. And then if, it's, if his story is right, if it's true, then he needs to stay there until the death of the high priest. Let's get into that a little bit. Look at verse number um, five. It says, so he, he pleads his cause to the ears of the elder and asking them to, to hold him there. And verse number five says, and if the avenger of blood pursue after him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand because he smote his neighbor. So when the guy comes after him that wants to kill him because he killed his, his relative or, or whatever, then that city is going to harbor that person and protect them. Now, next week we'll get into more of the reason, the reasoning behind why these cities were chosen and things like that. But there is only six cities. So this isn't, you can't just run into any other city. These are established cities for this purpose that everyone knows, hey, if, if this happens to you, then this is where you need to go. And they're going to go to the closest one to them, right? Uh, to flip over to Numbers chapter 35. And we see a lot of principles here that I'm going to be pointing out as well. Very good principles. And, you know, a lot of people argue about whether or not the United States is a Christian nation or ever was a Christian nation, things like that. But you can't argue that our system of laws was definitely modeled after the Bible. There, are, there were, and are to some extent, you know, laws that are, that are very much patterned after biblical principles. And it's not just the United States. I mean, there's, there's many laws throughout history have, have been patterned after principles found in the Bible. One of those principles here, and what, one of the things we see, is the, uh, an assumption of innocence until proven guilty. Now, we have that spelled out very clearly in, you know, in, in our country, but it's, it's a concept that definitely is found in Scripture. Even though it doesn't necessarily spell out you're innocent until proven guilty, in a sense it does because you need to have you know, the mouth of two or three witnesses in order for someone to be executed or put to death for a crime. There has to be evidence of it. The Bible talks about the, the judges need to in, um, diligently inquire and find out wh if what people are saying is true. You can't just, just, you know, one person can't just accuse someone else of something and then all of a sudden they're guilty. They hear it. They, they, they listen to it and they establish what's going on. And they have hearings. They have judgments. And that's something that is, that is evident in Scripture and that's what's going on here. So the city of refuge is just this temporary place to get protected from until you can bring it before the people who are going to hear you 
and hear the case. So in Numbers 35, look at verse number 11, the Bible says, Then ye shall appoint you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. And they shall be unto you cities for refuge from the avenger, that the manslayer die not until he stand before the congregation in judgment. So they're saying he needs to have his fair shot. So you can't just allow him to be killed by the person who's going to execute the judgment upon him until it's determined that he really is guilty and worthy of death. Now, we're going to get into that uh, about the avenger of blood later in the sermon and, and kind of go into all the details about that. But that is the person who would rightfully kill if he's determined to be a murderer, he would kill a murderer, okay? But if this guy isn't a murderer because he, it was an accident, then uh, he doesn't deserve to die, according to Scripture. And we'll get into that also. So the whole point of the city of refuge is just a safe place. He's going to go there until he's able to stand before the congregation in judgment. And the way that this works also is that he stands before the congregation in the city he came out from, which is another concept in our legal you know, you're supposed to be judged by a jury of your peers, right? That's the way that the United States works, is supposed to work, with, uh, with having a jury, a, a, a trial by jury. And I'm not going to get into all the reasons why I think, you know, our, our legal system is screwed up. You can figure that out for yourself, okay? Uh, um, it's pretty obvious, you know, the, the, all the guarantees and the rights that were supposed to be enshrined in our you know, founding documents of the country and stuff have all been eroded away and, and we're losing more and more. But even just a, you know, a speedy trial, a, you know, a fair trial or trial at all, now there's many crimes you don't even get a trial and you should be guaranteed that. In any case, um, the concept of a trial and, and having people judge you also comes from Scripture because here, this person's going to stand before the congregation in judgment. A congregation is going to be a, a group of people. Now, in our country, it's whittled down to, say, 12 jurors, which would be like representative of the whole congregation. That's, that's the way that it's formed here. I can't say that. I don't think that that's exactly the way it was, that the way God envisioned it when they're standing before, because it says they're standing before the congregation in judgment. I don't think it's an elected representative congregation. I think it's literally the congregation. I think the congregation, whoever comes together at these public hearings would be the ones kind of standing, they standing in judgment of. So um, let's move on to, look, jump down to verse number 26 here. Part of the problem with dealing, I'm trying to keep these, these concepts separated but they, they flow together, so I'm going to try to keep this um, as separate as I can. Verse number 26 in Numbers 35. Again, we're still just dealing with the city of refuge itself. Uh, it says in verse 26, But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whither he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood, because he should have remained in the city of his refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. So what we're learning in Numbers 35 is that if it's, this is already after a judgment that or even before, I guess it doesn't matter if it's before or after, if he's, if he's gone to the city for refuge, for asylum, to protect him against this avenger of blood who's going to kill him, what it's saying is that you have to stay there. These cities are designed for that purpose. And it's well known. And here's your boundaries. And you have to stay within that city. And if you've killed someone, even if it's by accident, if you kill someone, you still are, are going to receive a punishment. And in a sense is that you have to stay there for a certain period of time. And if you decide to just say, well whatever, I'm just going to go out and, and travel over here or go visit my family where I came from. And the revenger of blood finds you and kills you, then he's going to be guiltless. And it's your fault. It's what the Bible's saying. It's just like, well, you, sh you shouldn't have left. You say, yeah, but it was already determined it was an accident. Yeah, but it's your city of refuge. That is your safe place. You stay there, and, you, and you know, according to law, you'll be guaranteed to be safe there. Not everywhere you go. You need to stay in that city of refuge. 
That's the way that God's law determined this to be. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that makes sense. And the Bible doesn't spell out for us all of the reasons why that makes sense. But if you just think about it, I mean, if you were to lose a family member, they get killed, and yeah, it was an accident, but just the fact that you lose someone, that, that, it's going to cause a lot of emotion. You're going to be sad. You're going to be upset. You could be very angry at the person that caused it. You know, in, in our system of, of governance, our laws, there is a difference between a slayer, which we call a man, you know, manslaughter, and a murderer. But they both carry punishments. They both carry sentences. Just because you didn't intentionally do it, it still happened. And you're still, to some degree, responsible for that. So here you might have, you know, you have civil lawsuits and criminal lawsuits, which the Bible doesn't really have. That's all just kind of one thing, right? But you can, find, you can be free of murder in the United States, but then still be convicted of, of uh, not convicted, but, but charged with or, or held responsible, financially responsible for the death of someone else, right? Um, but let's dig into the, the difference between a slayer and a murderer. And this is really important concept to understand, especially you, you get a lot of people out there who misapply scripture as I brought up already once. And one of the most common things that I've seen is people who want to say that there's contradictions in the Bible at the most basic level when they say, oh, well, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. But you're saying that, you know, certain people should be put to death. Well, isn't that a contradiction? Because if the Bible says you shouldn't kill, but then it says, hey, if someone rapes someone, they should be put to death, then how is that not a contradiction? Right? That's, that's what people will say. And the reason they say it is because they don't understand, well, one, they're just not using common sense, first of all. They're not using common sense. But when the Bible says kill, it's not just referring to the loss of a life. This is thou shalt not kill. It's talking about murder. And that's evident, and I'm not going to go through every single instance. You can look up the word kill. You can look up the context of all this stuff. But anyone with half of a brain can understand that that's what it's talking about. You're talking about aggressing against people as far as stealing, mur you know, murder from them, you know, lying about them, whatever. All these different things you, know, you find in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. It's referring to murder. And that's why you have in the extent, you know, you can't just pick one verse out without all of the underlying explanations. I mean, look at these, these chapters are dedicated, these three chapters that we're going to be looking at tonight, that we are looking at tonight, are dedicated to just giving you all of the information in, in spelling out special cases and identifying what the differences are. Because there are differences between someone who accidentally kills someone and someone who is a murderer. So in Joshua chapter 20, where we start at verse number 3, it says that the slayer, talking about going to a city of refuge, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. So it says that the slayer, the, the slayer is a person who kills someone. But it says here it's a person that kills someone unawares like they didn't know it or they didn't realize that what they were doing was going to cause the other person to die that means that's what unwittingly means unawares it was totally unintentional yet it still happened think about you know people work construction jobs or other jobs where, where you could be around you know in dangerous situations or around equipment or machinery that can cause you know um serious injury or death People driving forklifts, carrying heavy loads, right? You could not see somebody and you drop the load. Oh, man, I totally didn't mean to do that. I mean, it's not like they had it out for them. It's not like they were trying to, to harm them, but still a person loses their life. It's a very grave, very serious accident. Nonetheless, it's still an accident. And the person who does that, who, who takes a life in that manner, does not deserve the same punishment as someone who has it out for him and says, I'm going to kill that guy. And I'm just going to go over there and I'm going to go blow his brains out or I'm going to intentionally drop this, you know, whatever. That, that you have something against him and you're going to do that. There's, there, there are two completely different things. Look at um, 
Deuteronomy chapter 19. Because the Bible spells it out. We're going to get even further into detail on this. Deuteronomy 19, verse number 4, the Bible says, And this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither, that he may live. Whoso killeth his neighbor ignorantly. Again, you didn't know. That's what ignorance means. Whom he hated not in time past. So there's one of the things that the judge is going to look at is, hey, did he already have a beef with this guy? Did he already have some problems with him that, that he hated him in time past and now all of a sudden he's turning up dead by accident? Or is it someone, hey, this is a friend of his or whatever, you know, it's... Someone he didn't even know. Those are the things you'd be looking at to determine is someone, did they kill someone ignorantly? Verse number five, it says, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. It gives you a clear cut example saying, this is what we're talking about. Two guys go out and say, hey, let's get, let's get some firewood. We're going to cut down some trees. And they got their axes and they're chopping away at the wood and then all of a sudden whoosh, the head falls off of one of them as he's swinging the axe and his buddy standing right there hits him in the head and the guy dies. He said, that's an accident. He didn't mean to do it. This is who the slayer is. Or the, you know, that's what manslaughter is. Verse number, um, flip over to Numbers 35. We're going to get more examples of this. And I'm trying to combine all these together because Deuteronomy 19, that's like the section that it uses to help define this. But then in Numbers 35, it gives even more examples and more cases to really just help us get our minds around exactly where we draw the line of the, the difference between the two. So in Numbers 35, we're looking at verse number 16. The Bible says, and if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall surely be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall, be sh shall surely be put to death. Now, this is important because this is defining what a murderer is. Now, again, we have a difference. We kind of strayed from this. You might have two people that get into a fight. And nowadays you can say, well, I didn't mean to kill him. But the guy actually died. But if they hate each other, according to the Bible, that is, you are a murderer if you kill somebody. Even if you weren't intending necessarily on doing it, there's no way of, of getting into somebody's mind enough to know their actual intent. The Bible just says you're a murderer. And it says here that if you, if you hit someone with an instrument of iron, like if you use a weapon and you kill somebody, you're going to be put to death. That's it. You're a murderer. So like even people, you know, whatever the situation is, you get in a, in a barroom fight or you're part of a gang or whatever, and you decide to pick up this bat and you crack someone in the head and they die, you're a murderer. It doesn't even matter if you say, oh, well, I didn't really want to kill him. I just wanted to hurt him. No, you're a murderer. You pick up a rock and you smash that into the guy's head and you kill him. You're a murderer. You use any instrument. So it says if you smite him with throwing a stone, if you, if you pelt a rock at him and the guy dies, you, you, you use a weapon of wood wherewith he may die and he die. He's a murderer. The murderer shall be surely put to death. So any of these things that you add to the situation, any type of weapon, and you kill somebody like that, the Bible says, nope, you're a murderer. And a murderer needs to be put to death. That's not an accident. You may say, I accidentally killed him, but when you're using weapons, it's not an accident. All the more reason people need to be careful to keep themselves under control. When someone makes you angry, someone does something that bothers you, and you may say, well, I didn't really want to kill. When you pick up that weapon and, and hit that person, yeah, you become a murderer. Now, a, ca a caveat for this would be someone defending themselves. And it doesn't get into that here, but I'm just going to throw it out there. I mean, if someone's breaking into your house, 
and you kill that person because you're defending your, your family or whatever, you are not a murderer in that sense, even if you do use you know, an instrument against that person when you're protecting yourself or protecting your family. But I didn't plan on getting into all of that stuff tonight because I'm just, I'm just trying to make a very clear cut example between the manslayer versus the murderer. Um, because these are all have to do with, with these, these various situations we're seeing here. Look at verse number 20. Numbers 35, 20, it says, But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by lying of weight that he die, or in enmity smite him with his hand that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death, for he is a murderer, the avenger of blood, shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. Now, the, the verses before that were pretty obvious of using an instrument, using a weapon, and saying, yep, you're just a murderer. But then he's also, this is where it gets more than intended, saying, if, look, if, if he's been in enmity with this guy, he's been an enemy, and they get in a fight, and he kills him with his hands, he's still a murderer. And that ought to make people be a little bit more careful about getting themselves into situations with someone that you don't like, that you hate, because you don't want to be, I mean, if you, if you kill someone, you murder somebody, you're going to be put to death. And especially if it could be determined that, yeah, he hated him, you lied in wait. Lying in wait means like you're setting a trap. I mean, you're like you're lying in wait. You're going to hide in the bushes until a guy comes out and then you're going to ambush him and attack him and kill him. That's what lying in wait is. However that happens, you know, you set a trap for him and, and you kill him. That's a murder. Verse 22, but if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without lying of weight. It wasn't intentional. He didn't plan it out. It wasn't his en enemy. Uh, verse 23, Or with any stone worth a man may die, seeing him not and cast it upon him, that he die and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm. Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the uh, revenger of blood according to these judgments. So he's saying that, you know, if he does happen to use a stone, right? Because it said earlier, you know, hey, if he smites him with this, he throws a stone on him, he kills him, he's a murderer. But he's saying if there was no enmity there before and, and he, you know, like, I mean, think about it. You're rolling a stone and you're working and there's an accident and it falls on him. You see where we're going with this, okay? There's a, there's a very, very, very clear difference between the two. So the Bible wouldn't go into this level of detail outlining a difference between a slayer and a murderer and one person gets put to death, the other person has to just go and live in another city. So if, if it determines to be, yeah, it was an accident, then what he does is he goes into the city of refuge and he stays there until the death of the high priest. And that's it. Now, um, I, I'm sure there's more. I, I tried to come up with more, and I, and I need to probably study this out more. I'm sure there's more symbolism involved and things to be learned on why that's so important, the death of the high priest being what releases that person back to his original homeland. But practical, practical purposes, it, it served practical purpose. One, it puts distance between you and the affected family for an amount of time because time's going to let those people not be so angry anymore as time goes on. Yeah, they're still going to be sad, but they don't need to see the person in their face every day after you just you know, accidentally killed them. Even though it's an accident, it's still not something you want to be running into all the time. Hey, here's a guy that, that killed my brother. Here's a guy that killed my husband or whatever, right? You don't want to have to see. So, so he separates you and say, okay, you're going to be over here now for a while until you could go back. And there's a punishment of all that. I mean, you're not going to be at home. You're, not, you know, you're, you're kind of losing some stuff because at the very least, you should be, care you know, be more careful because you're, you know, the result of maybe your ignorance or something you did, and you know, honestly, maybe it doesn't have, it, it really didn't have a fault. It, it still, to some degree, does have a fault on yours, right? I mean, you can say it didn't, but um, you know, there's that's why there's still some level of of a judgment against this person, even though they're not worthy of death. It's still uh, significant. Now, let's move on to the third point, um, and that's what has to do with the avenger of blood and the actual punishment for murder versus manslaughter. So in Joshua chapter 20, verse number five, the Bible says, and if the avenger of blood pursue after him, this is talking about after someone goes into a city, the, the city of refuge, the avenger of blood 
chases after him, he's pursuing after him, and wants to kill him. Of course, he's going to be safe in the city of refuge. But the avenger of blood, as I mentioned earlier, Numbers 35, 19 says, The avenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. I think this is actually a pretty cool aspect of God's law that he allows for... And, and again, this isn't with every single crime. The crime of murder or of losing a life is very serious. And there are some special instances and special cases that go along with a murder. And one of those is the person who's immediately impacted is the revenger of blood, like the, the, the closest of family, whatever. They're going to be the person who actually gets to execute justice upon that person. And I think that the way that God, I know, and I don't just think, I know, and you know what, science will prove this to you too, and you could, you know, you have a lot of people say, you know, maybe want to say different things, they want to believe different things, but... First of all, just when it comes to justice, victims do better in their healing and recovery after some, some crime against them or against a loved one when justice is served. And when I say justice, I mean real justice. So when, when a rapist goes out and rapes somebody and they don't really have much done to them, that has a huge impact on the victim. And it causes all kinds of psychological problems with them too, thinking that, oh, well, maybe I did, you know, they, they start to put more blame on themselves because almost nothing happened to this guy. But if you put the guy to death and just be like, we don't tolerate this stuff, yes, it's wicked as hell, and they're going to be put to death, and they die, and they see, wow, that person did that to me, and now they're dead. Now they can move on from that and realize this is not your fault. They shouldn't have done that. They're dead because of what they did to you. And, and even though I'm not saying there's just no repercussions of that event, it helps a person to move forward and just get past it. And one, not have to be worried about, is this guy ever going to come after me again just because he went to jail for five years or 10 years and now he's getting out again? Is he going to come after me? And you have to be worried about your own safety. You don't have to worry about your safety if the guy is six feet under. Now, but the Bible doesn't put the, the like, there's not a revenger of blood in all of those situations where someone's put to death, but in a murder, there is. And this is where he says, you know what, there's a revenger of blood, and he himself shall slay the murderer. When he meeteth him, he shall slay him. And they have the authority from God to kill that person. And obviously, there's this, there's this place to have a hearing, but the way that this reads is that you could have an avenger of blood kill somebody and it's a righteous, if it, if it turns out that, yeah, the, guy, you know, the guy's a murderer, I think even before the hearing, they'd still be justified in executing the justice and in, in, in making that. Because it's, it's talking about here, hey, you've got this place to flee into and you need to get there <laughs> before the revenger of blood comes to, you know, comes after you. And it says, but once you get there, if they come after you, then, hey, yeah, they can't do anything to you. But that's why it also says, hey, if they find you afterwards, if you're not inside that city and they kill you, there's no judgment against that person. They're not saying that God's going to hold that person responsible for murder if they execute judgment because you killed their loved one. If it's a, that revenger of blood doing it. Now, it's not everyone's a revenger of blood. Turn, if you would, to um, Numbers chapter 35. Numbers chapter 35, verse number 30. The Bible says, Whoso killeth any person, the murderer... And see, this is, this is again, where you can, you can start looking at... Remember I said I'm not going to go into all the, the places, the definition of kill? But here's a very good example, just backing up what I was saying. Verse number 30 says, Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. So it's there calling someone who kills the murderer. It's not referring to 
the avenger of blood as the murderer. It's not referring to the executioner of someone who's going to carry out a sentence that's ordained by God to lose their life as being a murderer or of even killing somebody. The word killing here is referring to a murderer, just like it is when the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. It says here, whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. And here we see there is one sentence for the murderer. First of all, it requires more than one witness. You can't just have one person say, oh, I saw him do this. That's not enough evidence to convict them and sentence them to death. But number two, it says you shall not take satisfaction means you can't take any other substitute for their, for their punishment. So you can't take money, for example, to free that person once they've been convicted, they've been found guilty of, of murder. He said, God just says, that person has to be put to death. They shall surely die. They're going to face that punishment. I don't care how much money the guy has. I don't care how many millions of dollars he wants to put in the hands of the victim's family. He says, there's going to be no satisfaction because no amount of money can pay for a human soul. You can't be bought with a price, except for the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that's the price that God paid for your soul. That's what your soul is worth. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. No amount of money on this world can cover that. And he says, you don't take satisfaction for that. The only way that, that blood shed can be paid for is with blood. The Bible says here, in uh, verse number 32, and you shall take no satisfaction for him that is fled to the city of refuge, that he should come again to dwell in the land until the death of the priest. So it's saying not only do you not, do you, you cannot take, you know, satisfaction, you can't take money or any other punishment for the murderer, but he says also for the manslayer, you cannot accept any form of money for him to, to leave that city of refuge early. He can't go back to the city just by paying some money. He says, no, you have to stay there until the death of the high priest. And that's the way it is. There is no substitute. There's no getting around it. That's the judgment and that's the way it needs to stand. And then in verse number 33, it says, so ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. For blood, it defileth the land. Shedding of blood, especially shedding of innocent blood, but this is just shedding of blood. Someone dies. God takes that extremely seriously. He says, the land is just defiled. It's dirty. He says, the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. The only right for that wrong, the only justice that can be served is that, hey, if you shed their blood by killing them or murdering them, your blood needs to be shed. And that's the only way that justice is served. And when justice isn't served, then God's going to make sure justice is served. He's going to bring it down. And when you have a lot of innocent lives and blood being shed in a country and nothing's being done about it, then God's going to bring his judgment. That's why in our nation, our land, there's a lot of innocent blood being shed and the, the, by the millions of children losing their lives on a daily, not millions daily, but thousands daily, losing their lives at the hand of doctors doing a medical procedure that takes away the life of a living person inside of a womb. And guess what? When that happens, there's blood being shed. And that's innocent blood being shed. And you know what? Those murderers that are going in there and cutting up little babies, defenseless, helpless little babies, nothing's being done about it. If we were lived in a righteous country that obeyed God's laws, that murderer will be put to death and he shed his blood Amen. in order to cover the blood of the, the innocent children being, being killed and slaughtered. But we don't have that. This is, the, and, and you know what? This was established as soon as Noah got off the ark. If you remember, with Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, you know, then you had the, the, the sin, came in the world, they were kicked out of the garden. And their children at Cain and Abel. Cain slew his brother Abel, right? But what was his judgment? What, what was his sentence? Well, he became a vagabond. 
You know, he was marked and he, and he went off and had to just kind of wander around until he died. And he, he suffered a judgment. But what happened shortly after that is then there started to be more and more wickedness increasing in the earth. And to the point to where God had to destroy everything with a flood. And he saved Noah and his family. And then in Genesis 9, um, I'll just read this for you. Genesis 9 verse 5, the Bible reads, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And he's saying, because I made you in my image, look, you're important. Whether it's a beast, an animal that kills a man, if an animal kills a man, that animal is put to death. Or if it's even another man, another person that kills a, a person, then they need to be put to death. And that's the only way, uh, the only justice that can be said. And that's something that's been established, since, like I said, since Noah got off the ark and should, st should still be in effect today. Now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 19. And this will be the, what we're going to close in this passage. It's a shorter sermon tonight, but uh, it's, a, it's a pretty simple subject matter. And I don't want to you know, belabor the points too much. I just want to make sure we, we cover all of our grounds here. Verse number six, we're going to look at, again, we're, we're still talking about the avenger of blood and the judgment of the murderer or the, the manslayer. Verse number six says, Lest the avenger of blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him. So let's actually, let's just read, starting in verse number four. I know we already read this, but let's get this in, in better context. Verse number four says, And this is the case of the slayer which shall flee thither that he may live. Whoso killed his labor ignorantly, whom he hated not in time past, as when a man goeth into the wood with his neighbor to hew wood, and his hand fetcheth a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slippeth from the helve, and lighteth upon his neighbor that he die. He shall flee unto one of those cities and live lest the avenger of, of the blood pursue the slayer while his heart is hot and overtake him because the way is long and slay him. Whereas he was not worthy of death inasmuch as he hated him not in time past. So it's giving us an example of someone, hey, he, it's manslaughter, it's an accident, but you need to have these cities designated for someone to go to and there needs to be enough of them so that it's not so far away that the guy that he's still upset about it and he's, he's just, just real hot over it and he's upset that he doesn't just overtake him because the way is just too far for this guy that, that made an accident to, to go and, and, and find refuge in. And he's saying, you know, God's basically saying, I don't want that guy to die. But he's also not saying that, well, if the avenger of blood kills him, he's, not, he's still not going to pronounce a judgment on someone who lost their family member um, and, they, and they happen to execute you know, the judgment upon them. So he's, but he's making this a way out. I mean, the, the, the design and the goal is that the guy doesn't die and that he could receive a fair hearing and that if he's found that, he, that he's just, it's just manslaughter, then um, he's gonna find that safety, but he has to be away from the person that he impacted. Uh, verse number seven, let's just keep reading here. He says, Wherefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt separate three cities for thee, and if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast, as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, and give thee all the land which he promised to give unto thy fathers, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which, is, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, and to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee beside these three. So the original plan is to say, Hey, okay, you need to have at least three cities, but if I give you more, then you need to add three more. And that's exactly what they did. They had three on the one side, Jordan, and three on the other side. So they had six in total. Verse number 10, it says, That innocent blood be not shed in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and so blood be upon thee. Verse number 11, But if any man hate his neighbor, and lie in wait for him, and rise up against him, and smite him mortally that he die, and fleeth into one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and fetch him thence and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood that he may die. So this also gives you the example, if someone did hate his neighbor, he's a murderer, but he still runs to try to flee into one of these cities of refuge. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why it's important to have you know, elders 
that can discern judgment and can diligently inquire and determine, hey, is this guy telling the truth or is he lying? Is, he, is this a case of murder or is it a case of manslaughter? And they make that judgment call and they say, if they find out, hey, uh, this guy is, and it's, you know, it says the elders of his city, of his city, the city he came from, shall send and fetch him thence and bring him back. And they'll talk to the, to the other elders of the city and say, hey, because the, the elders in the, in the city of refuge, they're gonna, this guy's going to come and he's going to tell them, hey, look, this was an accident. They're like, okay, well, come on in. We're going to keep you safe. But then the elders of the other city have to be like, no, this guy's a murderer. We've got the evidence. They're going to send for him and say, you've got to deliver this guy unto us. You know, he's actually a murderer. And they're going to deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood. And then, you know, the justice can be executed. And verse number 13 is very important because I think this is one of the reasons why the death penalty isn't happening like it ought to be in this country. Verse number 13 says, Thine eyes shall not pity him, but thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. If you want things to go well for your country, for your nation, murderers need to be put to death. And if you don't execute that judgment, it's not going to go well for you. It's going to cause more problems. You're going to bring problem upon problem and you will not prosper and you will not have peace because you're not executing judgment. And people want to have this soft spot and pity the person that ought to be put to death. And in doing so, you're perverting judgment and perverting justice and thinking that you are better than God. Because people say, oh, I just can't sample you. Know, these people can be helped. They can be turned around. Well, maybe they can. I'm not even saying that a murderer can't end up doing good and never commit murder again. I believe they can. But you know what? God's judgment is still God's judgment of saying they still need to be put to death. That's still what needs to happen in order to pay for the blood that they shed. You know, even Christians these days will try to tell you, well, we shouldn't have a death penalty because, well, we can get that person saved. If they live longer, it's just more of a chance for them to get saved. Well, then you're sacrificing. I mean, think about what you're doing. You're going to say, okay, we're just going to turn judgment on its head just to try to get this guy's soul saved. Well, what's going to prevent then more people from murdering? I mean, I know you care about that guy's soul. We care about everybody's soul. But what about the soul of the person he murdered? I mean, if he didn't murder that person, that person would have more, more chance to get saved then. And they didn't do anything wrong. What about that guy? You only care about the one left living. What about the one that died? What about the other ones that are going to die when you don't execute judgment upon people that deserve to be put to death? I mean, seriously, there, it, it, it's a fact. When you don't have justice carried out, when people could commit murder and the worst thing that's going to happen to them is that they're going to have to live in a, in a walled off building where they're going to be fed. They're going to have, you know, some level of, so, you know, they're going to have, they're not going to be put to death. They're going to be provided for to some degree. And that's the worst thing that's going to happen. They're going to be locked up in a cage. But that's the worst thing. It makes it a lot easier. And maybe they'll get out. Neither what are you saying, 25 to life? Oh, 25 years, but then I'm out again? I mean, look, I, look, I know no one wants to go to prison. Right? Murders don't want to go to prison. But when it's not like, oh man, if I do this, I just might not even exist anymore. I might just have my life taken from me altogether. That puts things in a different perspective. That might make you actually think twice before you go and actually kill somebody. Now, you're always going to have psychopaths. You're always going to have some people that just don't care at all, no matter what the punishment is. But there's also a lot of people that do care about those things that are going to consider. I mean, the rapist, the adulterer, the kidnapper, the murderer, the sodomite, that all deserve a death penalty? People might think a little bit more about their actions 
when there is such a consequence and it is actually carried out and not just said that, oh, we're against this stuff. No law is worth its salt without the punishment to go along with the law. Kids learn that from a very young age. If you, you know, your parents say, this is my law, you can't, do, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, but then there's no consequence for it or it's very minimal. They're going to do it anyways. And when we, don't, when we have laws, there's no point of having laws unless you're going to carry out the proper judgment. And for murder, the proper judgment is death. And for manslaughter, it's not being locked up in a cage, by the way, because that is one of the laws. And that's, and that's where one of the areas, I think, where our justice system has it wrong, too. Some people commit manslaughter and they still go to jail for, for however long. Maybe it's a shorter sentence, but they're still just going to jail. I don't think you should have your liberty taken away of sense of being put in a cage if you accidentally kill somebody. But you should have to just move away and go somewhere else and stay in the city. You know, I mean, God, God's ways are higher than our ways. And even if I can't articulate all of the reasons why God's way is better, doesn't make God's way any less right. <laughs> you still have to be able to say, this is the word of God and he knows what he's doing. And if we're going to be a wise people, we're going to make our laws and our judgments based off of God's word. So, you know, this, this is something that's important. It's mentioned in three different chapters in the Bible. And it helps give us a clearer understanding of these types of things. And we, we can't just take one, just one verse, thou shalt not kill, and just say, well, anyone who just takes any life for any reason, the Bible says oh, you shouldn't do that. No, let's, let's read the whole book and get the context of it, and let's apply what we learn here scripturally to, uh, to our laws and our governance. All right, let's probably have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the great wisdom that can be found between the pages of the Bible, Lord. I pray that you please open up our understanding of this great book and help us to just learn more truth and righteousness and be able to have proper judgment, Lord, and that we wouldn't show pity on the people that, that don't deserve it, that, that according to your word, we shouldn't have the pity on, or we shouldn't show them that, and, and that the justice needs to be carried out. God, it's, for the, it, it, it's, it's right. It's only right, and it's right because your word says it's right, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be good examples and to just teach others to follow your words as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.